Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Tenzin Yvong Dongchong. I'm a PhD candidate in the East Asian History Program here at Columbia, and I will be moderating uh, today's event. So this event is a joint collaboration between the Modern Tibetan Studies Program, the Weatherhead East Asian Institute, and the Rubin Museum of Art. It is sponsored by the Weatherhead. And before we start, I just want to let everyone know that this uh, Zoom event will also be recorded. So it will be made available for viewing later on the, later on the net. Uh, sorry about the noise. Um, so just a brief introduction to this event. Uh, we have four speakers today with us, all of whom are curators, and they represent three different American museums. We have the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Asian Art Museum of San Francisco, and the Rubin Museum of Art. So uh, all of these museums, they contain Tibetan collections, um, but because they operate on different scale, uh, the event is sort of designed to bring the curators together so they can share the, they can, talk about the process that goes behind the acquisition as well as the representation of the Tibetan collections, whether it is through exhibitions or through online collections. So um, I'm just going to, in, in terms of the format of the event, uh, we'll start off with individual presentations from the four curators, after which we'll have a discussion and then we'll open it up to question and answer from the public. Uh, if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A section that you can see at the bottom part of the Zoom webinar. So uh, before we start, let me briefly introduce our speakers. So first we have Dr. Kurt Behrendt. Uh, he is the Associate Curator at the Department of Asian Art of Met Metropolitan Museum of Art at the Met. Uh, he received his PhD in Indian Art History from UCLA. And his first book, The Buddhist Architecture of Gandhara, was published by Brill in 2004. His research interest, among other topics, focuses on Buddhist art and archaeology from the 6th to the 9th centuries on the Indian subcontinent. So after that, we have Dr. Jeff Durham. He's the Associate Curator of Himalayan Art at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco in California. Uh, he has worked there for more than 10 years. He received his PhD in religious studies and art history from University of Virginia, VA. Uh, in the past, he has taught at University of North Carolina and George Mason, among others. Moving on, we have Dr. Carl Debezani. He is a senior curator in the collections and research department at the Rubin Museum of Art. He got his PhD from University of Chicago in art history. His research interests include exchanges between Tibetan and Chinese artistic traditions, Tibetan art, and Sino-Tibetan relations. He has also worked as an adjunct lecturer in Tibetan art at Columbia University. And last but not the least, we have Dr. Elena Pakutova. She is also a senior curator at the Rubin Museum of Art. She completed her PhD in Tibetan art history and criticism at University of Virginia. Uh, she has curated numerous shows at the Rubin, the latest of which is called Awaken, a Tibetan Buddhist Journey of Enlightenment, which is currently actually on view at the Rubin and will be available until January 3rd, 2022. So uh, I want to thank our speakers for uh, accepting the invitation and joining us today. And uh, now we'll move to uh, Dr. Kurt Behrendt, who will start with his presentation. Thank you for um, inviting me to participate in your roundtable discussion. I'm excited to uh, to represent the Metropolitan Museum of Art and to uh, hear how we all approach these topics in different ways. Uh, one thing to say about the Met sort of as a sort of a point of departure is, of course, we're the oldest of the four museums. I mean, now at 150 years. Um, and uh, when when the Met came into being, it, um, it was really a, a museum devoted to European painting. I mean, this, this is kind of how, how it, it had its inception. So it's interesting to see how Tibet sort of finds its way into that rubric. Um, I show you a, this, this armlet from a, uh, a, for a sculpture that uh, came into the museum in 1915. It's the very earliest Tibetan object that I, that I could find in our holdings. It's part of a group of about 40 objects that, um, that came um, with Lockwood de Forest, who you see on the left. Lockwood um, was working in um, Gujarat, actually. He was part of the Gilded Age furniture movement. Um, he worked with Tiffany. 
and, um, and acquired um, a, a group of, um, of Tibetan works in 1913, and which he then sold to the museum. Um, and coincidentally, his brother, Robert, um, who you see on the right, um, had married um, a Long Island um, Railroad heiress and um, had become fabulously wealthy. And Robert um, was the president of the Met at that time. And so not only did Tibetan art come in at this moment, um, but also our, our very important Jain um, temple ceiling um, was all part of this single acquisition. Um, I, I think it's interesting that these two um, recognized that, that India and Tibet um, were missing from the, the corpus of material because till this point, and, and really going right till today, um, something like 90% of the Met's holdings come through donation. So what was collected by individuals in New York found its way to the museum. And, um, and so this, this purchase actually was I think quite strategic um, and, and telling. Um, and clearly, um, probably spinning out of the young, young husband expedition. I mean, given the dates, interesting. Um, Robert must have had other Tibetan works because his wife gives the Met this Bhadra Bhairava in 1931. Um, after Robert's death, um, uh, it's an 18th century piece. But at this stage, okay, right? These are the only two works in, in the entire holdings. Um, and, uh, and over um, the next decades, a few objects trickle in. Um, uh, this, I think, really fabulous Vajradhara, which I'm actually currently showing in a, um, a small exhibition, uh, Bodhisattva's uh, Wisdom, Compassion, and Power, which just went on view uh, two or three weeks ago um, uh, in our Indian Special Exhibition Galleries. Um, this object, um, though, arriving in 41 would have um, augmented um, collections of Chinese sculpture, Chinese Buddhist sculpture, a small corpus of Gandharan material, um, and some things from, from Nalanda in, in North India. Um, and together they were, they were being shown. So it, 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 it's an interesting um, moment um, of juxtaposed um, Asian cultures, all of which are, are being poorly represented. Um, in 48, um, we get another object. So these, these are sort of happening. And, and then, um, and this one I think is particularly interesting because it's so fragile. Actually, um, a tongue oil stucco with this wonderful um, uh, red gold um, finishing that probably might even be from the edges of China, um, 18th, 19th century piece. Um, and then in 69, we, we get a pair of, um, of really monumental um, wall painting size Mahakalas. Um, actually, this particular one um, is actually featured also in my show. Um, and here we are installing it. So that's, that's 1969, okay? Um, and then in 71, um, uh, the Asian art department sort of comes into existence. It had existed before, but had never had staff or, or resources. Um, and um, but in 71, Martin Lerner, and then soon after that, Steve Kosak um, joined the Asian Art Department. And, and it's at this moment that a, a small but, um, but significant collection um, comes to the Met. Um, they, um, they both had studied India, um, as I did actually. Um, and because of this sort of Buddhist studies slash India background, of course, they naturally collected um, the earliest horizon of, um, of, of Buddhist imagery from Tibet. Um, you get, you know, Atisha or or this Amoga city on the, on the right from the 12th century, very much resonating with I think Pala imagery of North India, right? Um, and they they go as late. I mean, well, here we have a you know a, a, fifth, a 14th century uh, mandala, but but done in um, a style that probably um, came out of, of course, Nepal, right? I mean, these these Nepalese artisans coming onto the plateau and and making imagery for, for Tibetan patrons. So, so we kind of see this, this, this connection to India. Um, and, um, and, and this is reflected again in, 19, uh, in 2012 when um, the Zimmermans um, give some objects and they're partially acquired and, and another group of, um, of, of very important objects come to the, come to the Met. Now, <clears throat> let me just pause at this point and, and just sort of make an observation. Because now 
by the time of, of, of the Zimmerman acquisition and this, this fabulous Buddha coming into the collection, we have galleries devoted to Tibet, to Nepal. Um, we are regularly doing special exhibitions on, on Nepal and Tibet. Um, and yet, you know, this is existing within, um, you know, this vast museum, right? It's, um, it's, it's hardly the focus of the Met. And more to the point, someone coming to the Metropolitan Museum of Art well, statistically, 50% of the people have never even been there, right? And so they're coming with no real perception of going to see the arts of Tibet. And that, I think, um, puts us in an, in an interesting position. On the one hand, um, we need to somehow or another explain this complicated tradition to, um, to you know, the vast public um, who's unprepared to, to address um, such a complex um, uh, body of ideology. And at the same moment, um, an object like, like this one um, I think is a natural um, for the, the metropolitan in that um, artworks that represent any culture need to be of the very highest quality simply because they're surrounded by other objects that are of the very highest quality. Each, each different group is sort of being represented by these, by these masterpieces. So, I mean, you, you have great Tang dynasty imagery, you have to have great Tibetan imagery, you know, you have impressionist painting. And, and I think that, um, that it's, it's interesting how we are in a way hamstrung by not collecting, for instance, archeological material or, or material that, that crosses all sorts of nuances of a given tradition. We're in a sense, restricting our collection to something that is small, um, but, but, but elegant. Um, oh, uh, a last work. This just came in actually as a gift um, from Jeffrey Kosak and uh, the very end of 2020 um, also will be featured in this upcoming show, this sort of, uh, late 11th century um, set of manuscript covers. But again, reflecting the, the early horizon of the Tibet tradition. Now, um, since I've started curating shows um, related to Tibet, uh, and now I think I've done four, um, I mean, Coming out of Gandhara and, and North India, I mean, you know, I, I did this bullet in Tibet and India. I mean, it drew on the strength of the collection. Um, and it's the kind of thing um, that, um, it's the way that we kind of, in a sense, feature an individual culture. This was a bulletin, which meant that it went out to all of the membership, um, something like 200,000 print run. So, I mean, a, a really big distribution. And it was actually mailed to every single member um, of the museum. So very different than a catalog, right? It's a sort of almost, it's a, a publication that the Met then sends out. Um, and, and in that context, I, I integrated some, some contemporary work, Dr. Gatso, Tenzin Rigdal. Um, in, in each of these different, different sort of windows, it's always a question of looking at something contemporary to talk about the past, um, or with my latest show, um, Bodhisattvas of Wisdom, Compassion and Power, which focuses in on Manjushri, Avalokiteshvara, and Vajrapani, it's teasing out these three sort of seminal bodhisattvas and trying to explain a body of ideology in a way that the public can grasp it, right? And, um, and to be focused. Um, I certainly could say a great deal more about our collection, but uh, I think I'd probably run out of my my initial time slot anyway. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, Kurt. We have Jeff next from the Asian Art Museum. Hi there, I'm Jeff Durham from the Asian Art Museum. I'm gonna share my screen so we can have a little talk. Um, like I said, I'm Jeff Durham. I'm the Associate Curator of Himalayan Art at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. Thanks to all of you for coming and thanks to Columbia for making this possible. Thanks to my colleagues for coming out to have a talk as well. Over the next few minutes, what I'd like to do is to tell you about how the Asian Art Museum approaches collecting and exhibiting Tibetan art, and perhaps give you a little bit of flavor for the collection and how it was formed. Now, the collection's founder uh, is a controversial figure to say the least. It is perhaps only fitting that I pirate a Shutterstock of Mr. Brundage, Avery Brundage, the decidedly unpleasant Olympic chairman and uh, of imperialist bent whose collection forms the nucleus of the Asian Art Museum's collection. Now, all told, Mr. Brundage's works amount to about 8,000 of the 18,000 that we conserve. To the right, you see the building that was the Asian Art Museum's first home in Golden Gate Park. It was part of the old De Young Museum. 
It opened in 1966, the year of my birth, to house Brundage's collection, and it was financed by the city of San Francisco with a voter-approved $2.75 million bond. But then in 1989, there was the Loma Prieta earthquake. You may have heard about it. Uh, you've probably seen images as well. Well, it really did a number on the old de Young Museum and it made it an earthquake hazard. Now, what happened at that point is that Mayor Willie Brown and Senator Dianne Feinstein got together and they offered the old Civic Center Library to the Asian Art Museum in 2003. And of course, both the feast and the founder came with us. Uh, the founder came in the form of a bronze bust that you see there on the right. And perhaps you'll recall the recent New York Times article that details its long overdue removal by our directorship. But the nice thing is that the collection came too. And if you go up to the third floor of the Asian Art Museum, you will find Tibetan art as it was exhibited prior to a 2016 minimal reinstallation. And here, Tibetan art is multiply nested in terms of its rubrics. First, within the Pan-Asian traditions on which our museum focuses, and then again inside Himalayan art. Now, this is an artificial category whose obvious intellectual flaws nonetheless serve a wide range of museological purposes that we're prepared to accept right now. Now, the visual presentation here is also problematic to my mind with its cinnabar walls and the visually similar bronzes placed deep inside seamed cases. We have a rather dated approach here. Now, why is it this way if we know about better ways to create context between objects? Simply, the demands of display in earthquake country make it prohibitively expensive to reconfigure mounts, cases, and galleries. So, to be effective in presenting Tibetan art here, we need to develop new strategies, as you will see and as I will get to. But first, let me introduce you to uh, some of the most outstanding works in the collection that you may or may not know about. The first is a portrait of the Shalu Monastery Luminary, Bhutan Rinchen Drup. Now the glow of its assembly of masters is impressive enough, but the reverse of this painting reveals some stunning information about the conjoined visualization and consecration practices connected with this tanka. If you look at the image on the right, which is the painting turned over, you'll see the phantom glow of Bhutan's pointed hat between two cinnabar handprints. That and the images below, the script below, are part of an elaborate consecration witnessed and sealed by three different Tibetan scripts. And in addition, and in total contradistinction to standard Tonka creation practice, it has been signed by the artist, one Ken Rob Jamyang. In fact, the Asian Art Museum conserves several important objects from Shalu Monastery, including this manuscript of the Manjushri Nama Samgiti. Um, now, according to the oral history that was passed on by the donors, this manuscript <laughs> was given by Rinchen Zongpo to Atisha. Atisha brought the manuscript to Shalu, uh, whose Alami wa watermarked image you see here on the right. And then a thousand years later, when China took over Tibet in the 50s, only two, the only two monks to escape Shalu carried the manuscript with them gave them to Losang Tamang, a monk in San Francisco, who donated it to the Asian Art Museum. Now, if you take a look at that accession number over the manuscript B86D5, 86 is the year we got it. So this is actually not part of the Brundage collection. Uh, Brundage just wasn't that into Tibetan art unless it was Imperial Chinese. But despite his apparent complete ignorance regarding Tibetan art and religion, and maybe despite himself too, Brundage did manage to obtain some rare and important sculptures from his network of dealers that remain worthy of study and exhibition, including these two superb West Tibetan Kashmir influenced Avagalokiteshvaras. Now in the galleries that I just showed you, we present these works together so that we can highlight the cultural and iconographic stories that each tells. But interestingly, there is no 
early Tonka in the Brundage collection, except for this one, which isn't actually that early. Uh, it's a vibrant and very steady Bumisparsha Shakyamuni, and it was displayed at intervals in the old Asian Art Museum in Golden Gate Park. But then, in 72, something happened that changed the game for the Asian Art Museum. The Fine Art Museums in San Francisco transferred a number of Tibet Tibetan works from their collection to us. Um, if you take a look at B72D60, which is a late Mori style Kurukala, this object is from the collection of one Catherine Ball. It is not a Brundage object at all. And uh, Catherine Ball's collection paved the way for the collection first of more Mori material, such as the mandala that you see on the right that is featured in Awaken. And it also paved the way for the acquisition of lineage trees. Also from the collection of Catherine Ball, uh, the one on the left is of great artistic merit and of historical significance as well. This is the sixth Panchen Lama, Losang Paul de Nieshe, at its center, with excellent detailing that I've reproduced in the middle of the slide there, right down to the Jnana Sattva in, uh, in the Lama's heart. So like I say, this refuge tree was the first one that we acquired. The image on the right, also featured in Awaken, is one of the more recent. Then in 1990, it was as if the floodgates opened, right when Wisdom and Compassion was published. Wow, uh, I've wondered about that. But anyway, uh, among the floodgates, uh, among the objects that came out of the floodgates was this, our oldest Tibetan painting, accession number 1992.58. Uh, this is executed in the old Pala Arshari style and it depicts the Vairochana of the Manjushri Namasangiti. Now on the right, you see an Asian Art Museum conservator working on this painting prior to its 2014 exhibition. It has a jaw-dropping history that I cannot tell you about. But I can tell you that this history reveals something that should be obvious to all of us curators. We must make the supposed rescue of such millennium-old masterpieces merely one aspect of our practice. More crucial now is that we foreground indigenous voices in the creation and interpretation of our collections and exhibitions. So what are we to do? I have two quick, real simple prescriptions that we've been experimenting with. Prescription one is to collect contemporary Tibetan art. We're just now beginning to do this as the old category neo-traditional begins to dissolve under critical scrutiny. But it doesn't stop there. Museums and curators must use their platforms to foster substantive dialogue, crucially allowing artist interpretations to guide the discussion. Now, our awakened conversations with Tsarin Sherpa, who you see on the right, regarding his painting The Melt, for example, were absolutely instrumental in shaping the course of the exhibition. Now, prescription two is to foreground voices that speak from and for the tradition. Both experts, like the two famous Bay Area Lamas that you see here, and the fascinatingly hybrid communities that they serve. Uh, by the way, ask me about Lama Kunga on the right in the painting that Orgen Chowang Kempo is talking about on the left. We can have a fun talk there. Finally, as our tech century unfolds, we continually iterate and experiment with digital modes of engagement, both in the galleries and in exhibition. Now, one example is our recent collaboration with Santa Clara University's Department of Neuroscience to create the Mandala Flow State. I did not come out with, up with that title, but uh, there it is. What it is, is a virtual mandala immersion experience guided by, yes, not biofeedback, but neurofeedback. Here's how it works. The subject dons an Oculus VR, which you see at the bottom left, and a Muse EEG headset, which you see at the bottom right. The dynamic, iconographically neutral geometries that you see represented in the center are initially clouded by fog, but that fog progressively clears as the subject's EEG measured brain waves change from all uh, excited and beta down to calm and alpha. We hope to use this technology to create in more sophisticated ways as we move forward, and we also have prototypes. So 
thanks for joining today and I'll look forward to your questions later on. Well, and now we come to the Rubin. Um, so Carl and I are gonna to present together. So, um, you know, switching slides, but um, just wanted to start with saying again, thank you uh, the organizers um, and the curators for providing this opportunity to, to have this interesting discussion. And um, we're also looking forward to the discussion afterwards, uh, after the presentations between the curators and then with the public. Unlike the Metropolitan Museum and the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco, the Rubin Museum is focused entirely on Himalayan art. Um, it's not really in our title, but that's what we're known for. And we are a museum of Himalayan art and ideas represented in this art and its cultures. The majority of our art in our collection is actually Tibetan. Um, and also I think it's important to remember that the Rubin Museum is not a private museum, but a public nonprofit educational institution. Carl, take this on. Mm. So uh, while it's a public uh, institution, the collection is based on the founder's private collection, that of Shelley and Donald Rubin. Uh, so for instance, here are the first two uh, paintings the Rubens acquired in 1975, and they mostly acquired uh, their collection from galleries in New York. Uh, the breakdown, uh, so there are about 3,370 uh, paint uh, objects in the collection. And uh, of those, uh, 2,146 are identified as Tibetan. Uh, uh, 1,750 of those are paintings or uh, 2D, while the remaining are sculptures or 3D objects, including masks and furniture. In other words, more than three quarters of the collection are, are painting or two-dimensional. And many of them are later 18th and 19th century works, which is a slightly different than um, uh, than some other collecting uh, emphasis in other institutions. Um, and out of the six floors at the Rubin Museum, the collection is primarily represented on three of them. Um, this is the Gateway to Himalayan Art, our introductory exhibition, which was designed together with our education, with our education department and opened in 2010. It is meant for the people who are not familiar with this kind of art um, to understand the main types of figures, symbolism, methods with which this art is created and its purpose. Next. Um, another installation, which used to be actually part of the Gateway exhibition uh, on a much smaller scale and now by popular demand has been um, expanded and occupies the center stage on the fourth floor in the um, exhibition which is currently called Shrine Room Projects. Our installation Tibetan Buddhist Shrine Room um, is kind of I guess one of the most liked spaces in the museum um, and we have had this installation since 2010 continuously and it changes uh, roughly around every two years to represent different traditions of Tibetan Buddhism. Most of the objects come from our collection but there are also some loans uh, from private um, collections and institutions such as Network Museum for instance um, and so on. Next. Um, but as you can see, you can't really enter the space of the shrine room, um, but you can enter it virtually. We have this um, Tibetan Buddhist Shrine Room Interactive, which you can access online as well as in the space of the gallery. And um, you can see down there the link for the interactive if you would like to use it for your classes or just have a kind of um, a walkthrough. So you click on this plus um, the things and um, it takes you to the object on view and you have description, several views and so forth. Next. So um, 
the Masterworks exhibition, which has now been moved to the fifth floor, moves geographically from west to east, exploring artistic and cultural relationships across the Himalayas, Tibet, and related cultures with which they had dialogue. And uh, this floor really takes Tibetan historiography of discussing art as its organizing principle, right? So Eastern Indian art, Kashmiri art, uh, Nepalese, and then Tibetan born traditions like Menri and Kenri and, and so on. Um, but we also have um, special exhibitions uh, with themes that take advantage of, of the strengths of the collection. So for instance, uh, patron and painter Situ Pancha in the revival of the encampment style in 2009 uh, was 80% uh, uh, um, drawn from the Ruby Museum collection and co-curated with the Tibetologist David Jackson, which was the first of a series of five exhibitions and six publications. And the tech, the, this exhibition takes Tibetan texts as its primary source to inform the narrative, especially uh, Situ Panchen's diaries. And it's uh, largely an art historical narrative. Sorry. Um, another example of um, a special exhibition that uh, draws entirely, almost entirely from uh, our own collection, but is also very thematic and um, innovative in its approach that kind of bridges the ancient tradition, history and art, um, legends um, and cultural hero, for instance, this um, Padma Sambhava with um, technology um, is the second Buddha. I hope some of you have seen it and it has been on view in 2018. Uh, we've used this idea of discovering something which is hidden, which relates directly to the terma or hidden treasure traditions of Padma Sambhava. Um, and created augmented reality interactives. Kyle, can you move on to the next one? Yeah, and you can start playing it. That's actually in a video. Yeah. So um, here you could see the painting um, kind of comes to life where the meanings that are implied or hidden are revealed through the use of augmented reality, um, these iPads that were there on view. And these interactives are not online, but I think they may be um, at some point possibly become part of the online access to the collection. We can move to the next slide. Um, we also created a video um, that explored three different philosophical approaches to time. Um, for instance, and you could see that um, on this on the exhibition's website, there are link right here. Um, one approach was from the point of view of um, just a regular person um, who thinks about time as a linear um, kind of passing of time. Second was an um, um, astrophysicist who talked about time in terms of space-time continuum. And the third was from the point of view of Buddhist understanding of time. Next. And um, another kind of special exhibitions um, we had um, that also were thematic, but required a lot of loans or objects um, not from our collection. And one example is this exhibition, The All-Knowing Buddha. Uh, it was centered around uh, 54 album leaves from um, Museum an der Strom, Antwerp in Belgium, um, and gave this unusual access to visualization process, usually not depicted, um, like literally. So this was a very unique um, set of objects that helped illuminate an important aspect of tradition represented in the museum. Next slide. So uh, we also used the Rubin Museum object and some other loans to help contextualize those uh, 54 paintings. So for instance, here we reproduce a, a table of ritual objects in the paintings to help the visitor understand the rituals um, uh, process depicted in the paintings. And um, 
there's uh, we had two uh, main uh, narrative threads. One was, of course, the emphasis on the visualization practice. So see here you see on the left an interactive uh, guiding the viewer through the stages of visualization, which is actually uh, color coded um, by the balloons, um, which you can see here. Um, and then the other on the right, uh, exploring the cultural connection. So we have an interactive um, which uh, charts the process of cultural translation. So Tibetan Buddhist content commissioned by a Mongolian painter and painted by Chinese artists. And these interactives are also uh, digital resources which you can um, uh, access uh, through the links that you can see below. Mongolian um, patron. Oh, did I say? Yeah, and Chinese painters. Yes. Mm -hmm. And here's an example of um, um, animation which um, visualizes step-by-step step how the image of Vairochana, this central figure of this visualization practice in the albums is envisioned according to Tibetan tradition and ritual manuals uh, known as sadhanas. Uh, we commissioned the drawings, each particular stage um, from um, Tibetan Tanka painter, Bucho Nukya, who is ha happily, by coincidence, moved to America and now resides in Queens, um, and then animated, ma made it into this video. We can skip through a little bit, but you can find this also on the um, web page of the exhibition, The All-Knowing Buddha. And it, it can be used, and I know that for a fact, it has been used extensively in teaching, let's say in Buddhism and religious studies, um, professors who show this for their students to, to, to make them understand how visualization practice is supposed to be imagined. Again, this is a 21st century um, interpretation of how it's supposed to be done, but nonetheless, I think it's very instructive and interesting. Next slide. And um, another most recent exhibition, which already been mentioned um, on view right now is this um, exhibition called Awaken, Tibetan Buddha's Journey Toward Enlightenment, which originally was conceived by none other than Jeff Durham from Asian Art Museum of San Francisco and a curator from the um, Virginia Museum of Fine Arts Enrichment. It was a much larger affair that started in Richmond and then um, was shown in San Francisco in reduced form. And now it is at the Rubin in a very different, much more intimate uh, format. And if you have a time, an opportunity, I urge you to visit because you have to experience it uh, in person. Um, this photograph doesn't really give you a really good um, a feeling of uh, presence of this sculpture in the gallery. Next slide. Um, in addition to exhibitions, we also um, putting our collection uh, online. Um, and as you may know, previously collect Rubin Museum collection was mostly known through the Himalayan art resources. Um, but we're now putting all of the collection uh, online. And at present we have 648 objects. And this is the page, how it looks right now. And our goal is to put a thousand objects online by the end of this year. So, um, and then this is what we're hoping to move for, uh, work, working to expand and uh, make available various other fields, including exhibition history, provenance, publications, and inscriptions, which you can see uh, uh, opened here, which I think will be useful for people working in this field. Now, this requires a lot of work on the back end by both the collections management and curial curatorial teams assessing object, cleaning up records. So this is a slow process. So uh, we uh, indulge your patience. Um, uh, another uh, digital resource related to the collection are uh, blog posts, audio tours, and art of the week that go into more depth on individual objects. Here are two examples. And we also plan to make these accessible through the online collection pages as well. And some of these uh, digital interactives and deep dives really um, allow one to explore 
um, the objects uh, in uh, much more depth. Uh, for instance, here we have a six foot uh, uh, wide painted woodblock print of a pilgrimage map of Wu Taishan. Um, and we have highlighted about 45 sites that you can explore, which include histories, excerpts from translations from Chinese and Tibetan gazetteers, as well as photos of the site and related artworks. And you can see the link at the bottom where you can find that. Uh, also, most of our previous publications, which often focus on the collection, are now available digitally for free. So for instance, uh, here's Martin Brown's Mandala catalog, which was very popular and long out of print. Yeah. Um, for additionally, for special exhibitions, we also had um, organized academic conferences and seminars related to the exhibitions on view. And um, many of them are available online. Here's an example of fairly recent um, seminar organized together with Columbia University and Skidmore College. You could see um, the general description here, but there's also um, links you can go and listen and view um, individual panels, including the last day where there was a concluding um, discussion in the end. Next. Um, we also wanted to briefly talk about our new initiative, Project Himalayan Art. Um, that has three main integrated components, publication, traveling exhibition, and digital platform. So uh, the publication, Himalayan Art in 108 Objects, which is our working title, will trace the art and material culture of the greater Himalayan region from Neolith Neolithic to contemporary times with a focus on cross-cultural exchange. So this is not a comprehensive volume on Himalayan art history. It's not the greatest hits, but will serve as an interdisciplinary introduction to Him Himalayan art and material culture. This will be an object-centered introduction focused on cross-cultural exchange with Tibet at the center. It's loosely modeled on the, after the British models, uh, famous a history of the world in 100 objects uh, with contributions from roughly 70 international scholars, including Tibetan, Bhutanese, and Mongolian scholars from a wide range of fields and disciplines. And our goal is to create an accessible introduction to Himalayan art and culture and encourage widespread incorporation of Himalayan art and culture into liberal arts curricula. To help identify our uh, teaching needs, uh, inter interdisciplinary humanities advisory group helped us shape the publication, including this general format the selection of objects and the contributing authors uh, and themes which they would focus on. And as you can see, they come from a very wide variety of disciplines and area specializations. Lorna? And here you can see the examples of the objects and sites that are part of the publication and as Carl mentioned, this is object-centered approach that allows to expand into various topics and disciplines and highlights cross-cultural exchange across these culturally related regions, but centered around Tibet. And we also have a traveling exhibition, which is a different set of objects than the publication. And publication is not the catalog of this traveling exhibition. The traveling exhibition will serve as an entry point for people who would like to teach anything related to Himalayan art, Buddhism, um, you know, uh, Buddhist iconography, whatnot, um, the production, art production, and so forth. Um, and it's conceptually based on the gateway to Himalayan art exhibition, um, targeted for colleges and universities in order to include Tibetan and Himalayan art in the broader context of teaching about Asia. Next. Um, the third component is the digital platform. Uh, it, it is still in conceptual development, but its main goal is to tie the publication and the traveling exhibition together and provide um, a broader context, they'll provide access to broader context so that this um, various links can be easily um, achieved. 
And I think this is all from us, right, Carl? Yes. Thank you for your time. Um, thank you so much to all our speakers. I think um, we got a sense of the nature of the collection present at the different museums and also the projects that are being undertaken at the institutions. So for those of uh, you who came slightly later, we have a queue and a uh, box at the bottom part of the webinar. We already started receiving a few questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to use that um, feature to submit your questions. So for the next section, we'll move briefly into a discussion with the curators and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So I want to start off with something a little bit more broad because each of the institutions are so different. Um, what is it about the Tibetan collections that are present at your museums that you think maybe the public might not know fully about? So what is something that is not widely known about the Tibetan collection at the individual site? Um, Jeff, yeah. So at our museum, one of the things that is poorly known about the so-called Tibetan collection is that it really is a, pan, it's really a pan-Himalayan collection. So for example, when you go into our gallery, you're going to see a wonderful Guhya Samaja in Tibetan style. However, that is not a Tibetan prod, product. It's a product of um, Ming Imperial workshops. Mm -hmm. Same with our star object, the, the Simha Vakta Dakini. She too is not a product of Tibet, but rather of imperial workshops. So when you come into that gallery, you can get the impression that you are, as it were, walking into a virtual Tibet, but this is simply not the case. This is a cultural amalgamation. And we try to make this clear, but until we can actually reorganize those earthquake stabilized objects, that illusion is gonna remain in place. You know, if I would, I mean, I think one of the big issues that we have at the Met being so big and, and therefore not focused on Tibet isn't so much Buddhism, because I think that the people come in and they can address Tibetan uh, material in a, in a Buddhist context. But I do think people have a, um, a huge issue making that leap to, to Tantrism and to understanding how this is Buddhist, right? And I, and, and I don't know a simple way to communicate that, you know, it's not, um, it's not obvious. Um, and I, I think this has always been a big stumbling block for the display of well, Nepal and Tibet. Anyways, it's something that my current show, for instance, is trying to unpack, but, but inevitably that gets complicated. And, you know, it, I, I'm sure at the Rubin, you also share this, this issue. Huh? Oh, I was just going to say one of the big challenges for the Rubin Museum is that everybody thinks it's a private museum funded by uh, wealthy private founders, but actually we are a public institution. Um, we, you know, apply for grants like everybody else. And uh, so, I mean, that's one of the big, I think, misconceptions uh, about the museum. Uh, also, we have uh, no formal relationship with Himalayan art resources. And so we don't control that information. Um, and uh, we often get written asking for images from Himalayan art resources, but actually, that's a it's 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 a sister institution that it, it was uh, we share a, a common founder but uh, that's its own uh, entity. Uh, we are getting a lot of questions, so I'll just end with the last question and then we can move into the Q and A. Uh, and Carl and Elena already talked about some of the projects that are working on so that they can bring the ribbon collection into uh, the mainstream or to academia and things like that. And I wanna give an opportunity to uh, Kurt and Jeff to ask if you have any plans on making your collection sort of more accessible or impactful for the larger public. I mean, I'm happy to, to just quickly address it. We, um, like the Rubin, have been building these websites where we are documenting the images and, uh, and as much material as possible. And I, I am so happy to hear that you've put all your publications uh, in a digital format. I mean, this is so helpful. Um, uh, and the Met has done that, uh, not for every publication, I think that we tend to not, um, you know, we'll have a print run for a period of time. And then after it goes out of print, it goes digital. So most of our things are digital now. And during this time of COVID, I've been reading other people's digital publications quite a bit, so I appreciate that. And on that note, I uh, also really um, think we should all be um, posting bibliography. 
uh, it would be so nice to know who else has published on these objects. Um, and uh, I, I, that's a huge job, but anyways, I'll, I'll just plug because we have this moment. To, um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't, we do all these other things as well, blogs and, um, you know, I, I actually think personally that we should do more of this posting actually um, presentations on our websites. I, I think that they are generally, um, you know, someone comes in, speaks for some reason, this this talk here, uh, and then it lives um, lives on in a digital format, so a student or someone could come back. To that. Um, and uh, I mean, uh, the Met does that. Uh, they have a tendency of not surviving very long. You know, they're there for six months and then they vanish somewhere. And, um, but it would be nice to archive that kind of material. So our accessibility initiatives are ideally what Kurt and Elena are doing. What y'all are doing is really quite remarkable in making the, not just the collection, but it's interpretation accessible to anyone wherever they are. And I think that's really awesome. Unfortunately, we're about five years behind that. And our conception is a little bit different. One of the things that we're doing is putting together comprehensive iconographic decoders that we can eventually put on uh, the web for the entire collection. So this is kind of the thing that Himalayan Art Resources has with its grayed out uh, iconographic sections and put her to the side. So we'll be doing that and posting it. In addition, COVID has given us an opportunity to create a whole suite of digital talks, virtual talks and uh, discussions of various sorts that we would never have uh, produced so nimbly in the past. So I think this has given us an opportunity, not just to be a location-based experience, but rather to be to expand beyond the walls of the museum, which is really what we want to do anyway. Okay, um, did you want to add anything to that or? The only thing is, is that we should all collaborate so that your links to my object goes to your video. I mean, there's no reason that we couldn't have a little bit of that built in to our website. Well, in fact, um, I, would, I would just um, quickly note that we actually are doing exactly just that for our project Himalayan Art. And while um, Jeff was talking about um, his collection, I took some notes so that we could incorporate some of the objects that you mentioned into our digital platform as a contextual objects for the um, project Himalayan Art. And, and some of the objects from the Met are actually among those 108 objects um, in the publication. So, I mean, obviously we're, yeah. we're trying to, yeah. Um, wonderful. So we'll now move into the Q&A section and I'll read out the questions uh, to the curators. So the first one we have um, <clears throat> is from Tierney Brown and she, her question is uh, for Jeff. Uh, she said, you spoke about the importance of foregrounding community voices in the exhibits and ended with the virtual experience of Mandela Flow State. I'm hoping you could talk a little bit more about how and why this exhibit came about. Well, Kurt actually said exactly how and why this, ex well, the, the why of the exhibition. Uh, my colleague, John Henry Rice of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts and myself were sitting around talking for hours and hours about the possibility of making Vajrayana art, Tibetan Buddhist art, comprehensible to a Euro-American audience. Now this sounds like squaring the circle. And in fact, I think that to some extent it is. But what we were looking for was a model that would apply in both cultural contexts that we could use to build an exhibition around. The model that we chose in collaboration, not just with us curators, but with uh, llamas and community members and artists was this model of a quest. And I know we're going back to 1945 and Joseph Campbell with all of this, but he did put his finger on something really important, which is this idea of a transformative quest. It's present both, you might say, in the Western intellectual subconscious, and it also informs initiatory practice in Vajrayana Buddhism. So in our discussions, we said, is there a way to authentically talk about Himalayan slash Tibetan Buddhist initiatory experience in a way that, it is, that the skeleton that we're using to create that experience 
is comprehensible to a Euro-American audience. And that's why we chose the initiatory model. And that's how Awaken came about. We chose the artworks so that they would speak to its various phases and do so in a way, hopefully, fingers crossed, that your average, well-educated Euro-American audience could understand. Um, I think the question was about Mandela flow state that you showed with the with the with the um, virtual VR set and the. Uh, I believe that we had a question at the end about the, the Mandela flow state and how that particular object came about. Mm -hmm. That came about as an attempt to specifically. Um, give people with absolutely no experience in any sort of contemplative discipline an experience of what it might be like to change their environment with their mind. Mm. And we do have data from that exper uh, experiment. Santa Clara University will be publishing those reports shortly. Mm. Um, so the next question is for all the panelists. Um, Goes picking up on what Jeff said about foregrounding indigenous voices. I wonder what would happen if indigenous voices asked for their artworks to be returned to their communities. Um, how would you respond if they were requests for repatriation or restitution? Or how have you responded in cases where this already happened? So it's a series of questions, but the questions are all related to the theme of repatriation or, you know. Um, so if you had experience with that in the past. Uh, we've had a good deal of recent experience and I can tell you what our policy is. If we have documentation that an artwork in our collection uh, came from a site, we know where it is, we give it back. And we have done that recently and we will continue to do that. Complete transparency. Now, of course, when you switch cultural contexts, as we do continually at the Asian Art Museum, the kinds of parameters that surround that problem change. So the sorts of UNESCO provisions that are in place, 1970 UNESCO provisions that are in place for, uh, for example, Southeast Asian art don't necessarily apply to the Tibetan, Himalayan, Nepalese context. And so we have to think about um, repatriation, whatever that means now, in different ways, depending on the nation state that we're dealing with. Uh, recently, we have repatriated two Thai lintels. It was a very uh, painful, but worthwhile process of transparency. And it was salutary indeed. We will keep walking down that path. Hmm. Yeah, no, and I would follow up with that. I mean, and we also, attempt to be completely transparent. Um, uh, and I think we're making steps towards that. Provenance is now um, part of our website. Um, you know, we try to actually be as clear as possible. Uh, Co-Care is a good example. Again, a Southeast Asian example, but there were these, these sculptures that came out during the Khmer Rouge. And um, I mean, once we realized that we had them in the collection, we proactively returned them. I, I don't even think we were asked. I mean, I think we just simply gave them back to the Cambodian government. Uh, it's a difficult question and it's complicated. It, it's legally complicated and in a way goes beyond the, the boundaries of, uh, of what we are as curators, I think. Okay. So we haven't had a lot of experience with this, but um, there, we have received a query about an object and we shared its provenance information and we encourage them uh, you know, that, uh, to share their information on the object and see if we can figure out if it's the same one. It's a little tricky in this particular, in one particular object's case, because um, you know it could be a workshop production, um, in which case there are multiples. But you know, uh, we we're uh, also planning to put uh, provenance, uh, you know, as part of our uh, online presentation for objects. I mean, we're a little hamstrung by the fact that um, most of the provenance information we have came from the private collection, right? And a lot of that was acquired through galleries in New York. So, um, you know, we don't always have as much provenance information as we'd like. Um, you know, and I've had, I had a discussion with Shama Rinpoche when we were in a gallery and, you know, he said, oh, I remember I saw that painting in Surpu uh, and it was done by the 9th, Kar uh, 10th Karmapa. And so we chatted a little bit 
But then as we sort of discuss the details of the painting, we realize that it's either the same composition or a, a much later copy of a similar composition or inspired by the painting that he saw. And so, uh, you know, we've had a, some, some similar dialogues, but uh, uh, I think it's especially tricky with some um, Tibetan material where certain famous compositions get copied uh, over and over or inspire or, or even painted woodblock prints. Um, yeah. That's especially tricky because those are made for mass production and mass dissemination. Um, and um, so the next question is specifically for the Rubin. Uh, would you say that your collection uh, focused more on educating people about art or educating people through art? I think it's both actually. I wouldn't say it's either one or another. Um, and to be honest, we can give you examples of the two exhibitions that we just talked about, the Gateway to Himalayan Art and Masterworks of Himalayan Art. They have slightly different goals. Gateway is the introduction, um, educating people about art and Masterworks is educating people through art. I would say, if really briefly put it in this way. And many of our exhibitions that are actually thematic, they do specifically that, they educate about and through. There is no other way, you know? I mean, art is, is an object that has a lot of meaning in it. So you educate about it and you educate through it. I don't see that it's a contradiction. Does it make sense, right? Yeah. Right. You know, I think for all of us, we try to inspire people, you know, to put art into context where they, where it resonates and has meaning, mm -hmm. which, which is different than educating about a topic, right? I mean, it's, it's that you kind of interact with this object that produced a thousand years ago, and it has meaning personal to you at that moment. Um, I mean, you can build apparatus around that, but that's a different thing than, than trying to convey a body of information through that piece of art. Mm -hmm. And the next question is uh, from Sarah McNetta. Uh, she asked, uh, where do you see the future of Tibetan art collection slash display or exhibitions in your particular institutions or more broadly? Uh, Jeff mentioned his two prescriptions. For others, what changes do you hope to see, if any? Uh, I can start. Uh, well, one thing, of course, is that I think museums are looking more and more internationally, not just at addressing whoever can walk, who ever happens to be able to walk through their door, whether they're in New York or San Francisco. Um, and that's part of Project Himalayan Art's goal, too. But I think that's, uh, my sense is that's a, a trend more broadly in museums generally. You, uh, attendance in museums, I think, has been down sort of across the board and not just you know, galleries, you know, uh, presenting Tibetan art, but just across the board. And so I think that uh, um, digital engagement, um, certainly through the pandemic, um, that was kind of a, a how shall we say, um, that was being thrown in the deep end in a way. Um, but I think that this is really kind of pointing towards uh, the future. Um, and I'll say something else is that one thing I've really been delighted about uh, I've attended a couple of job talks, which normally are not uh, uh, something that people would air online. And I've actually been quite delighted to see uh, a number of Tibetan PhDs, uh, you know, Tibetans who were trained in institutions coming out with PhDs and, imply, and applying for positions. Uh, and uh, I think it'll be wonderful both in the academy and in uh, uh, museums to see more and more uh, Tibetans uh, taking up these positions and uh, representing. So um, that's something else I see. I would also add to that, that I, I really hope that the young generation of Tibetans um, would be more interested in, in art, not only in contemporary, but in traditional. Um, and because they now, they have this context, they grew up here, they understand what the museums do, 
right? So, and I think they are actually much more receptive to the way any museum presents um, art or exhibitions and, and, and so forth. And I think I would hope to see more Tibetans coming and visiting our collections and bringing their friends. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, just as a counterpoint to that, I think, of course, bringing in the Tibetan communities is important. I think also bringing in communities that are not Tibetan and having them be exposed to Tibetan art, equally important. I don't know, I think that, that we try to do those things together, right? And somehow or another find those, those linkages. And that's tricky. And, and you ask about the future, and I don't really know what the answer to that is. Certainly contemporary art has is, is brought in interesting new ways of thinking about the present moment and, and about historic works. I, I found that that's changed the way we think about doing displays at the Met. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> okay, moving on, uh, we have a question about, um, from Sak Takayasu, he asked, if you leverage oral history in your exhibits, um, could you please uh, tell us about how it was used? Also, if applicable, how do you share the interviews conducted in Tibetan with visitors who do not speak the language? We do not record and post the interviews. Most of the sorts of community engagement interactions that we have are held in our uh, so-called orange room up on the fourth floor of the Asian Art Museum. So we bring people, uh, um, that, that's, that's where that happens. Uh, could you restate the question? I had my kid yelling at me in the other room. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> the question was um, if applicable how do you share the interviews conducted in Tibetan with visitors who do not speak the language? And in general, if you use uh, oral history in your exhibits or not, and if you did use it, like how did you use it? What was the experience like? Uh, so uh, like I said, we don't share the interviews typically. We hold those uh, in the museum and those go into a kind of document that we create and that we use to uh, inform the procession of the exhibition. Uh, if there are relevant interviews and we did have one that we unfortunately weren't able to include. It was from Lama Kunga in the slide that I showed you. If we do have those, we do two things. The interview, is, since Lama Kunga speaks English, that would be recorded. Then we would also have a track that was in Tibetan and a track that was in Chinese, which are the two language that, languages that would be mandated by the institution and by the nature of the exhibition. So you do more than we do. We will have interviews, but we'll usually do it in the form of a talk, something like this. I mean, it's very hard in gallery to ever have sound. It's been my experience that even pictures sound is, how do you handle, I mean, if, if you have a successful exhibition and 100,000 people roll through, you, you really are hamstrung with having sound or having something that is in another format. I, 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 we struggle with that anyway. I, do, I will say though that with all of our, um, um, we are now doing captioning, I think with all presentation. And this has been a big shift. Um, and I've noticed it's even happening um, uh, in other contexts as well in the museum. So there's this idea of, of, of starting to translate across platforms, um, but we do it you know, using the computer program, right? So it's sort of implicit, especially when you start talking about something like Tibet, which has words that um, let's see. Well, it's true. Sound is really tough in the galleries. Um, and we did have an exhibition, for instance, on the Drigong tradition, um, which uh, called Art with Benefits. Um, and there's a, there's a lesson not to make a joke in a title meeting because it'll come back to bite you. Um, but anyway, it's really, it was really about this kind of special class of beneficial to see uh, objects. And so we um, invited a, a Drigong Kempo to come in and talk about within his tradition how he see, saw those images on a personal level, um, but also through their tradition, um, you know, what was important and powerful uh, about these uh, objects. So that, but that's very, you know, 
uh, audio tour is a somewhat limited. Um, and then in other cases, certainly um, like David Jackson in his series, uh, you'll notice that he interviews a lot of artists um, and then he will draw on those and, and quote them. Um, and then some portion of that may make it into the exhibition, but more likely it's gonna be in the publication. Uh, just because when you're limited to 100 to 150 words uh, on a label, um, that's uh, kind of a limiting format. Mm -hmm. So the next question is from Lauren Hartley. Uh, she asks, could each of the speakers let us know roughly how many textual items are in your uh, quote unquote back rooms and your thoughts on providing some uh, basic metadata for those items? Might there be a role for universities to assist in doing that? I wanted to clarify textual items. Does it mean um, texts or manuscripts or things with inscriptions on them? Um, so the question just says textual items, but I'm imagining it's any kind of objects that has some textual inscription written on it. Like could be a picture, could be like a piece of um, well, have we data about an object? Yeah, Carl, go ahead. I'm just guessing that since Lauren Hartley is a librarian, I'm guessing she's talking about texts, um, but that's my sense. Um, and I will say for the Rubin Museum, we do have a few texts, but it's not something that the Rubens were particularly interested uh, in collecting. Um, you know, we do have, you know, say a, a, a title and a frontispiece from an illuminated manuscript, maybe. Uh, I think we have a full blown, uh, uh, text in Mongolian related to the bardo, which is uh, nicely illustrated. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I would have to say that it would be a very small part of, of the collection, but, you know, if people want to work on them, that would be great. Uh, we, you know, we try to be very open. Uh, of course, during COVID, it was a, it's a little difficult, but, you know, make an appointment a few weeks in advance and, and, uh, well, I also want to add, in, in addition to other textual data, which could be inscriptions on the reverse of the painting or something like that, um, we're going to put this all eventually online. So that could be available for anyone who would like to um, read them and maybe you know use for their own research purposes. So this is all kind of in, in the works and coming at some point, hopefully soon. Yeah, we put as much of this material on, on the website. I mean, that's the easy place to, to uh, like an inscription on a painting. Absolutely. I mean, we'll, we'll do our best if it's been read or even if it hasn't been read, to for, for a picture. Uh, and this, this goes across all sorts of different objects. But there are many, many scripts, right? Um, if you start thinking of South Asia. I have to say with actual text, and, and there's been discussion of collecting text, but then we're in our history department. We're not really geared for text. And so there was talk of, of actually having our library, Watson Library, which actually has a collection of rare objects collect texts. Um, I mean, as, a, as an institution, we back away from that idea, but but I, I think that is the way to do it. I mean, it should be um, someone who handles books who should curate such a thing, I would think. We have about six manuscripts. Um, only two of them are of very high quality. One of them is that uh, little Manjushri Namasangiti with a few leaves that, uh, that supposedly belonged to Rinchen Zongpo. We have <clears throat> a partial manuscript also in that golden indigo that is something to do with Chakra Samvara, but it's not enough textual sample that uh, my poor familiarity with that text lets me identify. We've got some very nice imperial manuscript covers, but if you go back to the Brundage collection, guess how many textual objects Brundage was interested in? Zero, totally uninteresting to him. So all of our acquisitions, meager though they may be, have been in the post-Brundage period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Uh, Lauren did write to us. She said she was referring to text, manuscripts, woodblock prints, and pictures. So things that are not on display, but might be in the back room. Because usually in the Columbia libraries, we tend to have finding aids for these materials that are not accessible. So people can just sort of browse through the finding aid and get a sense of the collection that's physically there and then visit the actual site. So perhaps that's what um, she was uh, referring to as well. Um, yeah, as, as imperfect as it is, I think all of us attempt to put our reserve holdings, or because we have life sensitive objects and we're locating them. Mm -hmm. I mean, our websites hopefully are documenting a lot of that material. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think as part of our collection rollout too, and we actually, this was a discussion, how do you put a, te a text online in a collection sense? So I think our, our hope is to have one entry for the overall text and then have each and every page uh, represented. And you, um, I forgot to mention in the um, aspirations to the future for our online collection is that you'll be able to click the image and download it. Um, mm -hmm. So um, the resolution should be good enough that you should be able to click each page and read it. Um, so, but that's a lot of work, it's in the works, um, but that is our, our, our goal. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so moving on to the next question from Dawa Goso. Uh, does any of the museums have any intention to develop or procure materials, artifacts for ex exhibitions on early pre-Buddhist uh, uh, Tibet, such as the archeological products from uh, I think it's Tulan Craves, which has excellent art pieces. I think this is a, a specific question regarding like a, a type of uh, materials or artifacts on early pre-Buddhist uh, Tibet. Do like, any of the museums have intentions on collecting materials, uh, perhaps for the individual's interest? I mean, I'll say that excavated material is very difficult, um, for instance, um, and uh, right, I mean, and, and regarding provenance and all of these other issues, you know, how it was removed, all of these things. Um, and also, um, you know, so, so I would have to say that, that it's, that's one issue. And then of course, the other issue is, um, you know, uh, our museum largely depends on donation. So uh, <laughs> I think yeah. those two factors probably would say no. I think you would borrow in the context of a show perhaps, right? From our host country and you would say, well, you know, we're going to, you know. I, I was wondering, did the, the Ruben get the Gilgit manuscripts actually for your, uh, your uh, collecting paradise exhibition? I, I know that they were published and, you know, I always, it's the kind of thing that one always wants to see that's sitting in some far off museum and you've never. Well, never. when we were, I can answer that um, just briefly because um, there was a terrible flood, flood mm -hmm. um, at the time and the museum from which these manuscripts were supposed to be traveling was flooded. So this was uh, not possible to do. Um, so we don't have much time left, so I'm going to uh, skip the questions uh, on topics that we touched on before. Uh, moving to the next one, if not limited by budget or logistics, what would your display, what would be your display or curatorial strategy for a complete redisplay of Tibetan collections? If you do have an intention for that, would it potentially, quote unquote, foreground indigenous voices? And if so, is it through consultation? Is it through co-curation? And this is from Tutin Kelsang. Hmm. All of the above. Yeah, that's great. So through both consult consultation and co-curation. And co-curation, I think that mm -hmm. Absolutely crucial. We're working on a show co-curating uh, in such a manner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, that would be great. We used to have a, a fellowship where we would try to bring in scholars and we brought in a scholar from Bhutan hoping, for instance, to be able to um, work on an exhibition together, but it didn't work out. But that's definitely aspirational, um, but logistically um, and, and for practical reasons, it, it sort of fell apart. But um, yeah, that's very much on our uh, wish list, it seems to be. Right. Yeah, I think he also um, added that if logistics and budget were not a concern, then what would be sort of the curatorial strategy? Um, and uh, moving towards the last questions, uh, we have one from an anonymous attendee. Is it possible to incorporate the narrative or background stories of collecting Tibet and make that accessible to public? Maybe through labels or publications where did those objects come from? Who created them? What is the role of these objects in contemporary Tibetan lives? Um, so, um, so there's a series of questions about, you know, contextual information related to some of these uh, objects that are collected or donated at the museums. Well, I can say something that maybe um, answers part of it. Uh, well, we mentioned the project Himalayan art, right? Um, so through the digital platform of that project, which is one component of this uh, larger uh, initiative, um, all of this is totally possible. Um, and we also do talk about what these objects, um, not what, what they are, but how they used and how they were created. I mean, this is all part of the Gateway to Himalayan Art exhibition. Um, you know, like we translated the dedicatory inscriptions, let's say for, for um, of a painting that uh, was commissioned by a husband of a wife who passed away in order for her to have a, a good rebirth in the next life. I mean, this is how the objects are used. This is exactly like it's documented in the object itself, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, all of this is, is part of how we exhibit the present the the objects mm -hmm. and and uh, the plans are to go on and make it even more um, accessible and make it more um, kind of broadly contextualized through these various components of the Himalayan um, project Himalayan art. You know, I think we all try to do this in our labels. Part of it is is that you have a short label, right? That you you can't give too much information or you start to confuse your audience. You, you, you have to be sort of succinct because you have many objects. So then you try to, these, these very issues that this, this question, I mean, these ideas that this question is bringing up are all things that we would like to address, right? I mean, it's just a question of how much of that you can say and, and what framework you say. If you put it on your website, if you have a blog, you publish it, you know, you have these different venues. Yeah, perhaps it's easier to sort of do it online rather than physically. Uh, so you can include more information on a website versus a physical label that you would put next to an object at the museum site. Um, and lastly, there's a question about semantics. And because we uh, call this event uh, presenting Tibet, but what became obvious is it's not just a question of Tibetan art. Uh, we have Himalayan art as well. And I think the ribbon in the past, the question is about you know, this, the category of what it means to have Himalayan art versus Tibetan art. And because both, uh, perhaps some of you could speak on that. For us, it's just a stratagem. Uh, <clears throat> and we try to be very transparent about it. It would be very difficult for us to take our, our, our fine Chinese imperial Vajrayana material, put it in the Chinese galleries and explain what was going on there. The idea of having a Himalayan gallery is a way to take the cultures that have participated in Vajrayana art production to have that material presented together in an integral kind of way. Um, and unless we have a really large budget, you know, uh, to completely rearrange things, that bin has to stay in place. And the reason is simply the size of the collection, which is quite small. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I also think that, you know, when you think of the Himalayas writ large, in, um, a lot of places, right? And where do you draw the lines chronologically? You know, Kashmir is part of the Himalayas. Is Gandhara part of the Himalayas? Um, are you going to talk about Hinduism in Nepal as part of the Himalayas? You know, I, you know, whenever you kind of start to to throw things into categories, it becomes harder and harder to to draw lines around them. And I think we all struggle with these things. I think for us too, the cultural connections are, you know, that kind of story is so compelling, uh, right? So, what does Mongolia have to do with the Himalayas? I mean, there's no arguing. There's no way to argue that Mongolia is in or uh, in the Himalayas, but when you look at the deep cultural connections, historical, religious, um, right? As Bob, Bob Thurman used to say, uh, scratch a Kalukpa, find a Mongol, uh, right? I mean, there are so many Mongolians training in the three big monasteries in, in Lhasa, for instance, uh, or go to a Mongolian monastery, right? And find images, um, that are very closely related to, you know, those those sister institutions. Um, that, yeah, you know, it is it is a bit of a conceit in a way, but but it is also a way to look at these uh, very deep and interesting cultural connections. Um, but yes, as as a strict category, as I think Jeff mentioned in the beginning, uh, it's very problematic. Um, uh, So I think uh, we'll have to wrap our event uh, here with the time limit. Uh, I wanna thank, first of all, um, the curators for preparing the presentations and sharing their knowledge with all of us. I wanna thank all the participants for coming in. Um, and so today we talked about uh, three specific museums. So of course there are many other, I just wanna mention there are many other museums in the US with Tibet collections as well. And depending on the nature of the institution, they might have something else to add. So this is not supposed to be a definitive take on you know, Tibetan collections in the US, for example. It is talking about these three specific museums and hopefully we can have more of uh, similar kind of events in the future and keep the discussion going. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us this uh, afternoon.